after listening to today's episode, there's a few things I want you to look out for. The first is how to distinguish between the market value of your business and its personal value to you. How to piggyback on someone else's brand equity to grow the value of your business. How to foster solid relationships with well-known brands. How to deploy an unorthodox negotiation technique to get the deal terms most important to you. And how to avoid a shady tactic used by acquirers to get your business for a discount. Here to share with John the full story is Mac Lackey. Enjoy. Mac Lackey, welcome to Book to Sell Radio. Thanks. I'm happy to be here. How did ISL football come about? Tell me the founding story here. Sure. So I, I, my life was kind of in two big buckets. You know, I was a soccer player and, and fan. I played through college, played after college, kind of been my life passion And along the way, I also had the luxury of having a couple of soccer-related businesses. And um, my favorite team on earth was FC Barcelona. And a lot of my friends knew that. I was a big fan. And long story short, there were a couple of young individuals that happened to be living and playing soccer in the United States who were very connected to FC Barcelona. And once they heard that, they basically asked me to help them start their first company. Um, and what they sort of said is, we're incredibly connected to FC Barcelona and we think we can do something unique. And you have a lot of experience in not only business, but the business of soccer in the United States, which is quite different than uh, soccer anywhere else in the world. And so we, uh, we formed this partnership and it was two young guys coming right out of college that I was helping start this business and um, happy to dive into the details. But yeah, we became the largest partner of Barcelona in the United States and probably the world um, in, in many respects. So uh, great. Gosh, so what, what was the first, so you, so you had this kind of uh, sort of initial kernel of an idea saying that the founding partners had, had a direct line into the FC Barcelona leadership. And here you are in the United States. Of course, the United States has soccer, MLS and, and so forth, but Barcelona doesn't necessarily have a physical presence here. So what was the idea in, in the U.S.? Yeah, so the real opportunity that a lot of people haven't understood about soccer in the United States is where Barcelona is, um, Catalonia in Spain, um, there are 200,000 registered players in their association. There are 20 million registered players in the United States at the youth level. So the numbers are massive. And the opportunity was quite simply take the power of the brand and methodology of FC Barcelona and bring it to this massive consumer market who wanted to learn that methodology, wanted to participate with that brand, go to the camps, go to the clinic. So it was basically connecting these two worlds that had not been done at scale um, really up to that point. That's interesting. I've got a buddy here in Toronto whose kid's an exceptional soccer player. He's a young kid. He's probably 15 or 14. And he has uh, been selected to to play in uh, an academy uh, program mm-hmm. by Toronto FC. So Toronto FC is the, is the professional soccer team in, in Toronto. And they have an academy team, which is sort of a uh, a pipeline, I guess, of young players that they're grooming, but they, you know, the parents pay money to send these kids to these academies. And and it sounds like you were, you were sort of using the same idea where people, kids could go to these FC Barcelona camps and clinics and, and you were kind of trading on the name FC Barcelona. Am I getting that right? Yeah, it's exactly right. And, you know, one other little 30 second story, which was very foundational for me at a personal level is when I was in high school Again, soccer was my passion. I wanted to play in college. I wanted to play beyond professionally. I was too old. I was pre MLS, but um, in high school, I got selected for a U.S. team that went into South America, Brazil and Argentina. I went to Pele's house. I met Pele. I watched watched Maradona play for the Argentinian national team. That experience, which was about three weeks of kind of what they called an immersion trip, we played and we had these amazing experiences, literally changed my life because I saw what was possible because these were the best players in the world. These are the best teams in the world. So I went from my little bubble of being a relatively good player on a local or regional level to 
wow, this is a whole different world. So a lot of what I, I believed, kind of the thesis was, if we can expose these Americans who are in Toronto, well, you know, Toronto, um, Buffalo and, or uh, Charlotte or whatever. All yeah. over the United yeah. States. Um, if we could expose them to what I would argue is one of the greatest teams on earth, the great, one of the greatest brands on earth in any sport, and really show them what's possible, then we're bringing that to them in the United States. The other thing we were doing very quickly is picking some of the best players from those camps and clinics and saying, we'll now take you to Barcelona and you'll do the immersion trip. So we were taking something that was life-changing for me and doing it with FC Barcelona. So it was kind of both directions. Um, and that became our powerful formula, if you will. Cool. What was the business model? How did you make money? So we, we basically made money... Um, really on all aspects. So the camps and clinics we would do, American families, um, generally upper middle class families would pay for their son or daughter to come to these camps. We were profitable on those camps because we were doing a good job of connecting the brand to American consumers. Barcelona kept giving us more states, more states. So that was growing really quickly. Um, and then we would take those, again, best players to Spain on these immersion trips, which were very profitable because they were done at scale. We were, by the time I sold my interest, I think we were taking about a thousand kids a year um, on these immersion trips. And, you know, they're, they're paid travel and nice trips, uh, but really meaningful life-changing opportunities for the players. So those were the two primary revenue streams. We diversified into player management, a lot of other things, and they're still thriving today even after I you know, sold my interest. But um, that's kind of how we initially made money. So the immersion trips, the parents would pay for the kid to go tour around Spain, play and, and get exposed to some of the, the better. Cool. Exactly. Sounds so fun. And did you also participate in any of the merch, like merchandising revenue, shirt sales, you know, domestic? We did. And, and again, the, the, it's an eye opener to other countries because the American consumer is just such a unique animal you know, when you go to a, a – because we were parents of two daughters that played soccer. And I knew personally that when I signed my daughters up for a camp and there was an opportunity to buy an extra jacket or shirt or bag, we bought it all. And so <laughs> – You're that parent. <laughs> yeah. We made a key part of our strategy to – we had a deal with Nike and Soccer.com, which was the biggest e-commerce player in the country – and we provided a lot of that gear, but we gave lots of opportunities to upsell by official products. And so, yeah, that was another component. Got it. And so how big did you get this business before you decided that you wanted to step away? Like in terms of revenue, sure. whatever proxy you want to use for size? Yeah. So we were uh, self-funded, didn't raise any capital and grew kind of zero to eight figures in about four years. So we got over, you know, 10 million in revenue, very profitable, um, kind of self-funding. Uh, so it was a great, rapidly growing business that was only expanding more and more. Got it. And and you mentioned it. Well, let me go back to before we break. Talk about the actual breakdown of the revenue. So you had camps, the immersion, chip, immersion trips and merchandise of the eight figures. Like, could you put proportions around that roughly? I would say uh, I would be, I would be uh, yeah, going rough, but I would say probably over 50%, approaching 60% were the immersion trips. Got it. Okay. And so those are high margin, but not necessarily recurring with the same family. I'm assuming that you, know, you go once. Correct. Yeah. We did. I mean, uh, we did, and they have continued to do a really nice job of partnering with other super clubs around the world. We started with Barcelona, then there were other clubs added, which did give you the opportunity to say, hey, your son or daughter went to Barcelona last year. Would you like to go to Italy next year or Germany or England? So, you know, taking that same model and replicating it with other clubs and licenses became part of the growth strategy. How did uh, FC Barcelona manage the risk to the brand? So let's say little Johnny goes on the Barcelona trip He's a great kid from St. Louis and he goes to Barcelona and he's playing soccer and he twists his ankle and somehow the parents blame you guys for sending him to the, you know, whatever. Sure. Like this kind of stuff happens all the time. Uh, how did FC Barcelona, like, did they give you like 
standards around the camps and the immersion experience that, that they needed you to hit in order to continue to use their brand? Yeah, particularly the, the things that were really licensed, which was you know, the methodology and using the brand. There were a lot of, I would say, very rigid guidelines around utilizing that and delivering on a camp experience down to you know, the ratio of kids to coaches and all kinds of things because they really care deeply as they should about their, their brand. Um, and then we were effectively a licensee that were, you know, carried insurance, had to, you know, operate a pretty professional organization, deal with parents, which is a whole nother ball game. Um, but absolutely the big, the big brands in the world, the big clubs, you know, they, they care deeply and, and, they're pretty rigid, which is one of the things that really helped us because I think we professionalized this model where a lot of other people were trying it on small scale and they weren't quite meeting the standard. And so all of a sudden when we came along and we were doing it at scale, they said, we'll give you more, more states, more territories, more growth. So we went from one of several, I think they had four or five partners to far and away the biggest relatively quickly because we took all that stuff very seriously. And did you push them for exclusivity in the US? We there was there were pre-existing partners when we sort of arrived um and so we didn't really ever have the potential to be exclusive and we just looked at it as an opportunity to become the biggest and best and grow with them and over time I mean it's probably I mean I'm not involved anymore but I would still guess it's you know 80 to 90% of the market in the United States is that one company. So there are some small players, not much left. But your success is unintentionally, I guess, lifting up all the other players in the U.S. market. So there's four other providers of, of the FC Barcelona methodology. You guys are killing it. You guys are investing in all the marketing and the systems and kind of they're riding on your coattails because you don't have exclusivity. Like, did you think about that as a potential frustration? Yeah, it's, it's, there are geographic exclusivities. And so for good or bad, there were areas that we could not get exclusivity or we couldn't get. And over time, you know, key markets like California was on our short list early on. Well, someone had that. Eventually, we got all of California. We got all of Texas. And so we won them by, you know, being patient. But there was definitely a tide rises all boats with the brand and the things that we were doing. But since a lot of our revenue and opportunities really existed with taking you know, people back to Spain, we didn't really have much competition in that, in that arena. It was really just local camps, which was kind of a customer acquisition strategy. Got it. Got it. Okay. So I want to turn to the financing of this business for a second. So first, just to unpack the business model camps, I'm assuming you take a deposit up front from the parents, so they're relatively cash flow positive, immersion trips similar, so you can kind of structure payments in a cash flow positive way. So I'm imagining it's not hugely capital intensive, correct me if I'm wrong. Correct. Um, and at the same time, there's a kickback back to, not kickback, that's the wrong choice of words, <laughs> especially in the context of what we're talking about. There is a, there is a, uh, a licensing fee paid to FC Barcelona, which I'm assuming is a percentage of revenue you get from the camps and immersion trips. Is that yeah, it was actually a, a it was a flat fee plus percentages and and relatively hefty one, which again was um, the strength of their brand, but also that kept some of the lesser, you know, the, the idea of licensing a brand sounds great and sexy. Then when you get into the math, you realize you have to run a pretty good business to justify some of the fees and sharing some of that revenue. So, uh, so yeah, that was a little bit of a barrier to entry for, for some folks. Yeah. Uh, but I, I miss, are you able to share any of those numbers or is that stuff sealed up? Yeah, that's, that's pretty confidential and, and okay. it could be a little bit dated anyway for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's, I appreciate that. I, I, obviously there's, there is a, a revenue sharing agreement in place. So like, a, so it's a flat fee plus a, a kind of a percentage of revenue makes, right. makes perfect sense. So let's get back to the financing. So although relatively, uh, cash flow positive, if you will. I'm assuming you needed some money to get this thing off the ground. And you had two partners that were just coming out of university. Again, I'm guessing that they didn't have a lot of cash to contribute. So how did you structure it in the early days from an equity share and who was kicking in the money and that kind of stuff? 
Yeah, so we had a, a relatively unique situation. You know, it was a point in life for me where I, you know, had already had a, a number of exits. I was very fortunate. Um, I wasn't looking to do anything new per se. This was something I was really excited about out of personal passion. I saw the business opportunity and I felt like um, in order for me to justify even you know, time, which sounds awful, but at that point in my life, time remains the critical thing for me. And so it was, you know, in order for me to do this and put my name on it and go to my contacts, I'm going to need to be the majority owner, but I will start the business. I will, you know, leverage my network. I will take, you know, that risk on. And um, so we structured it basically where I was the majority partner. I kind of did all of the upfront you know, structuring of the business, financing of the business, kind of got all that going. And, and they had some very valuable, unique connections and expertise, having grown up in Barcelona, um, having played at a high level. I mean, they certainly were young, but they had a lot of valuable expertise. So they, they became the other two minority uh, equity holders. Who kicked in the cash? We didn't, didn't have to kick in a lot, but it was mostly me. I mean, anything we had to spend money on, it was out of my pocket. Okay. So you're the majority shareholder, but you've got these two minority partners. And, and did, at what point did you discuss uh, liquidity options for them, ways for they, that they could potentially become majority shareholders or, or buy you out? Did you guys talk about that from the beginning? Or that's, that's a really interesting, the way it sort of evolved is this was for me because I had you know, sold some earlier businesses. I, you know, that was kind of a, a theme as I was good at building stuff up and then ultimately creating liquidity events. And so I, you know, I told them really early on, this is not a business that I want us to grow and sell. This is something I could do the rest of my life because it's personal passion. I want to help you. That's a kind of new chapter in my life. I'm trying to mentor people. And so it all kind of lined up for a very long-term opportunity for me. Um, I knew they were very ambitious. They would want to have more ownership. And so all we really discussed early was I am significantly older in age. And even though I'm passionate, my life chapters are going to be changing. And I would love to look at it almost like a law firm where I'm the old partner and we use the success of the business if we're so fortunate to kind of buy me out and accrue more of that ownership to you. I like that idea. That was kind of how we discussed it early on. There was a, a later moment where we sort of changed that and got more intentional, but that's how it was discussed kind of initially. Got it. And and so the idea was that at some point the business would be profitable enough to effectively buy you out using the profits of the business. Yeah, I so thought I would go from majority to minority over some period of time with hopefully success of the company. Got it. So at the 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 eight figure mark in revenue, I'd be curious to know like roughly what kind of margin you were making on that. Like how much was 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 there left at the end of a, a good year? And, and the reason I'm asking that is I'm trying to figure out how, you know whether the company had enough to kind of <laughs> fund your buyout. <laughs> yeah. So um, like all early stage high growth companies. We were fortunate in that we were profitable pretty much from day one. We structured it that way. We were very intentional about it. I was at a point in my life I didn't need income, so I wasn't taking any money out of the business. My partners were young and had very low expenses, so they weren't taking a lot of... And we owned 100% between the three of us. Um, And so we really were using a lot of the profits effectively to grow and scale. But I mean, we you know, if we would have just sort of taking a point in time, it was, you know, we were probably generating a million plus in EBITDA if we really didn't pile it back in and hire people and expand aggressively. Um, So we were, you know, taking distributions. They were doing well, certainly for their, you know, age and what their other options would have potentially looked like. Um, But we were not trying to maximize that. We're really trying to grow add other licenses, add geographies, things like that. So we were definitely piling back into the business. Okay. So most of that million plus in EBITDA would have been going back into the business yeah. with some shareholder uh, dividends coming out as well. But Correct. most of it would have been, yeah, you weren't just sitting on this cash coach, you know, 
shooting out tons of money that you were pocketing along the way. It was being reinvested for the most part. For the most part, we yeah, we really saw an opportunity to, to scale uh, in a lot of different ways. And so we, we were reinvesting pretty heavily. Okay, great. What changed? Why did you decide to sell your um, proportion of the business? So there were a couple things that happened. You know, one was I... I had just had a, another liquidity event and I realized that the, what I call, you know, chapters in life, I could suddenly see my two daughters were about to go off to college. And when they did that, you know, my sort of freedom and thinking would change because I spent a lot of time in my life with, you know, whatever company I was running and my daughters, my family, everything else was, you know, kind of very secondary. And all of a sudden it was like, I'm going to be an empty nester. Um, I don't really need, you know, sort of income per se. I want to be able to travel and spend time with my wife. And so I saw this chapter changing. And one of my partners also said something about I wasn't really actively running the business. I was relatively passive at that point. And, it, and he just said, you know, we would like to be the majority owners one day. And I said, I'd love for that to happen for you. But it was pretty clear t- to me and I think to them that, you know, that was a long process unless we agreed to something that was reasonable. So that and we were friends and we got into a, a healthy dialogue about what would it take for me to sell, go from majority to minority? What would it take for me to truly sell 100 percent of my interest, both in terms of numbers and anything else that mattered to me? And it was really healthy because um, as a small group, we went from this conceptual idea to, okay, there's a number that's probably far too big for them to write a check for. But now we've all sort of agreed that if that happened, we would proceed. So now we became aligned in how do we make that happen? How do we find money to back two young, very talented guys? How do we use the business in some way as leverage? So I went from like, potentially being on the opposite side of the table with them to we're all on the same side of the table trying to figure out a transaction that we agreed to on paper. So that's kind of how it happened. Makes a ton of sense. What did you think the business was worth on a multiple of EBITDA or multiple of revenue? Like, I'm not sure how you were thinking of valuing it, but. Yeah, in my mind, it was a, um, conservatively, it would have been a multiple of EBITDA, like a lot of companies, you know, it would be hard to argue that there wasn't something real there. It was growing very quickly. We had a lot of new opportunities. I think you could have argued there was, you know, something pretty significant beyond a standard EBITDA multiple. But I also um, really believe that if we did it in a friendly way and we did it faster, that it would be better for every. I would rather take less money now, but be like it's clean. They have it. I've, you know, I've switched gears in my life. I've you know, do what I want versus think about this. So we we came to a a number which was a, you know, a a multi seven figure number that felt like it balanced that really well. I knew it would be worth more in the future if things continue to go well. I didn't really want to wait for that. I didn't want them to have to wait for that. So we agreed to what I would call a low to reasonable multiple so we could get it done. Yeah. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm, again, you can confirm deny or just tell me where to go, but like, I'm thinking it would have been a, like a, a six or a seven times EBITDA. Am I kind of in the ballpark eight times? Yeah, I think, that kind of a, yeah. Ish, if it's growing quickly. Yeah. Yeah. That's the way we, we sort of looked at it and said, you know, let's find, let's find the right balance of, and in my mind, guaranteed cash, even though I love the business, it was like, it's got to be guaranteed cash or, or there's no reason for me to do it. I, I'm the majority owner. I have, you know, a lot of upside. So it was, you know, cash at close versus any kind of structured payout that's guaranteed felt appropriate to me. And there were some other perks, which I'm happy to talk about that were like, hey, you know, those are valuable to me too. They mean maybe as much as money, but certainly are worth considering that I felt would be easy for them to do and would be valuable to me after I sold the business. And so like what were some of the perks that you saw? Well, one of the things that, that naturally happened um, in this business, because, you know, again, big partnerships with Barcelona. I had lived in Barcelona and had amazing season tickets. 
I had access to the club and the players. We had a big partnership with Nike. So going to Champions League finals in other countries or being, you know, being invited to events as a VIP, um, I could pay for those things, but it felt different when you get invited. Sure. Nike's like, hey, come to our box. And so one of the things that was happening more and more for the company was we were getting these opportunities and invites. And I said, look, I, if I step away, I'd like to have out into the future the next four or five Champions League final tickets. I'd like to have the World Cup. I'd like to have, which I knew would be relatively easy for them and would even feel less than money. But for me, I would have four or five years of amazing matches to go to that would feel like a gift. It would be free, you know. So we we structured some things like that, which uh, you know were really a good fit for both of us. Awesome, awesome. It's super good to know some of the intangibles. It's like I can't remember who wrote the book on negotiation, whether it was Chris Voss or I'm sure there's other negotiating, but you know, understanding it doesn't have to be a win lose. You know, there can be things that you value or who I think it was. No, it was the secret to a good negotiation is, it, it is, I can't, I, I wish I could give credit to it, but it's basically, you know, negotiation class 101, two people want an orange, you know, most people say, well, just split the orange down the middle. The actual savvy negotiator realizes that one party wants the rind of the orange and the other person wants the meat. And if they can leave the negotiation with what they want, they don't have to split anything. They get the pieces that they want. And exactly. on, again, I wish I could give credit to who said that, but anyway, someone will tell me on the internet, I'm sure. But that's what you were doing in FS, isolating some things that were maybe more valuable personally to you, but not necessarily to them. Yeah. And, and the other thing that I did, um, which I think is, is really, um, I'm, I'm glad I did it. I think it's really, you know, important, smart, whatever is, you know, we, again, we talked about guaranteed cash and that was two components. There was a cash at close that kind of had to meet a certain number again for me to feel like it was the right thing to do. But then I said, you know, let's make it easier on the business to pay me out over time and you can pay me monthly for years. The good news is if I can get my tax advisor to agree that it's long-term capital gains and how I'm, it's just a structured payout, it's tax efficient, but it's basically like income and revenue or a salary for me for years where I have no delivery, no expectations. I just get paid. And so, yeah, of course, time, value, money, all these things people argue. But to me, that felt really good to know I could wake up and I had an income stream out over time and it made it a lot easier for them than trying to figure out how to front load all this cash. Um, So again, that was one of those that I felt really fair and good about how we did it. So again, if you can't share, I totally appreciate it. But if you take the proceeds you stood to gain from being bought out and you had sort of a, a pie, what proportion of the pie would, were you looking for cash at close versus a structured payout over time? Like, can you give me proportions there? Yeah, I would say it was probably um, a little over 50% cash at close. Yeah. And then the remainder with with zero performance, no other caveats, just structured out over time. And then what was your recourse if those payments were unable to be made? There were a couple things we did. I also gave them an incentive that the faster they paid it, the cheaper it was for them. And so if it was paid in four years versus five, you know, there were these kind of formulas that were very simple to say, you want to pay it faster, it's cheaper for you. You want to wait all five years, no problem. It's just the most expensive. Um, there were some, you know, interest kind of kickers on any failure to pay. And then there were some equity ratchets at the end of the process if for some reason they fell short. Um, but we both what is, what is an equity ratchet? What do you mean by that? I could go back and take equity back. So uh, I sold 100% of my equity at close effectively, cash at close, payments out over time. So I own zero shares. And as long as they continue to pay, worst cases, they're maybe going to pay some interest if they're delayed in payments. But after some period of time with no cure, I could reach back and grab equity. And 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 get equity in a business that presumably was 
struggling. If they weren't paying the bills, then the business itself may be struggling. So how did you, I guess that's the downside of a potential structured payout is, is, is getting equity in a business that's struggling. How did, did, is there a safeguard against that? Or the, is there a way to sort of minimize the potential risk there? I mean, my view, I don't know. I'm sure there's people a lot smarter than me that can that sort of document around some of these things or craft it. My view was if the business, you know, one, I'm getting a fair, you know, fair payout at, at close, which makes me feel good. I'm very confident in the next year because I'm, you know, I'm seeing the trajectory. I think I'm going to continue to get payments. And so I'm moving further and further down the line of, you know, I'm paid. There's pretty you know, low risk. Those out years definitely carried some potential risk, and I was willing to, you know, kind of take on some risk. I also looked at it like my absolute worst case scenario was if I did have to come back into a business that was struggling. That's a business I know pretty well, and I, you know, again, I may not be able to do any better, but at least I had a chance, right? I could try to reinvigorate or do something new and different. Um, so going from you know zero ownership and no control to putting myself back into a position to try to recover. But I was willing to take a fair amount of risk that, that they would continue to pay. So I took that risk for sure. Got it. And so let's walk into the deal itself. So you have the conversation with the guys and your sort of junior partners, if you'll allow me to use that expression. And they said, yeah, we want to own a majority of this. So where does it go from there? So we, we talked about, you know, again, the framework, what is the number? What's the math look like? Um, and we agreed to all those things and basically said, if they, you know, they could talk to pretty much anyone they wanted, friends, family, financing sources, I would be on their side of the table to say, hey, I'm, I'm a big believer in this business. I'm willing to roll equity if someone wants me to, like I'm not opposed to that, which would be a signal of strength potentially, um, to their story. And, and we basically just had an a ongoing dialogue where they were out talking to prospective investors, primarily starting with friends and family, uh, who would be aligned with them. And then ultimately finding uh, a financing source and, and a hedge fund that you know could provide more financing and basically back no different than a venture capitalist would say, hey, Mac or John, I want to back you on this idea. We had an existing business, but this hedge fund was kind of backing these young, talented guys. And I wasn't in some of those conversations, but I mean, if I were them, I'm sure I would be saying, we're going to get, you know, Mac who's getting older and we're going to, you know, so I, it was a very friendly way to just say, let's all work together to get the financing you need to meet both of our goals, which is to buy me out, let me step away and get you majority control of the business. Okay. And so the cash at close piece was in part what they definitely needed to finance. They needed to come up with like a source for that. Yep. Were, was the business profitable enough on an ongoing basis to pay the the stipend, the monthly stipend for you over five years without getting extra financing for that? The business Yeah, had- I was confident that it that it could and would uh if if things kind of continued and they might have to you know, decide to take fewer distributions personally with the, you know, make the sacrifice in the short term for the much bigger upside on the backside of this. When these payments are done, they're not paying back anything. They get it all to themselves. I was pretty confident they could do that without any external financing, uh, especially if they tight, if they needed to tighten their belts. Um, and also thought it was, it was growing like crazy. I mean, it didn't look like it was plateauing. I thought, you know, next year is going to be better than the previous year. So I was pretty confident in that. So the hedge fund that 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 reached out or 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 agreed to finance this deal, what was in it for them? So some of that I'm I'm not completely you know privy to because that was really I I left that for my partners to have effectively a new partner that was a bigger financial partner um, that wasn't an operator, but that you know needed to be long term the business and the way i understood it and it all made sense to me was you know their families which were not wealthy families were backing them in a very significant way they had the buy in of 100% of the team they had the buy in of all of our strategic partners they needed a financing partner who probably believed in the business model 
and wanted to back these two guys. Um, and I think, you know, I think that happened. And I think, you know, a lot of people, if you have a passion for the sport or the underlying subject matter, whatever your, you know, the business is, you can even get over some of the financial things. Like I don't have to, you know, cross every T if I'm thinking, well, a strategic byproduct is I get to go to FC Barcelona games or I get, you know, there's other cool benefits. If you're a incredibly wealthy angel investor, you might value that, you know, in some ways. So I think there were a number of things that came together. Um, and, you know, my two partners were, were talented. They did a really good job. They, they're very, I, I kind of did the same thing even earlier by putting a lot of my time, reputation, some of my biggest contacts I brought to the table at risk because of these guys. And that kind of bet or backing an investment was continuing with new people when I was stepping away. Excellent. So the they get the hedge fund in. What was the the final negotiation like? Because, you know, hedge funds are generally pretty sophisticated buyers and they can get their elbows out when they need to and make sure that they're all sorts of like, was there anything that's sort of surprising or, or uh, uh, contentious in the actual negotiation itself? You know, from my perspective, I, I agree with you a hundred percent. And, and I, you know, made a decision that it was very black and white for me, you know, two things kind of had to happen. The numbers had to remain consistent. Like I don't, there was no need to come in and talk about adjusted EBITDA or anything like the number was the number, period, end of sentence. It was, I thought it was very fair, if not even conservative, but it was not a negotiating point in my mind. And the other was it had to be a friendly transaction. The minute we started like turning, you know, guns at each other, like I would just step back to what I was already doing because I was perfectly happy. Uh, so to me, those two truths and kind of rigid things allowed us, and I'm sure they felt the same way about some things. It's like, we don't need to talk about that because that's not a negotiating point. You know, if you think the number is unfair, that was six months ago, you know? <laughs> so, but it was very friendly. It was, I think everybody went, went into it with the goal of like, it has to feel good all the way through, even post wiring the money. Like we need to be able to call each other the next day and nobody really took advantage of the other person. And, and it felt that way to me. I hope they would say the same. Um, but being relatively rigid, particularly around numbers, knowing sophisticated financial people could argue all day long with spreadsheets that my logic was flawed in how I'm looking at the value. Like, okay, that's not the, that's not the discussion we're having. You know, here's the purchase price. So that was, I think, one of the reasons we didn't really get into a lot of that. It draws the, for me, it reminds me of this notion of there's two values. There's the value of the business and there's the value of the business to me. And those numbers ne aren't always necessarily the same number. Exactly for right. you, you've gotten clear on what it was valued to you. Yeah. And that was the number that, that you were that you were agreeing to negotiate on. Did you, I, I'd be curious to know, again, this is more you know, some of my listeners may be in the same situation where they're, they may have partners and maybe going through a buyout or, or something like that. Were you negotiating directly with the hedge fund or were you negotiating with your former partners who were being briefed by the hedge fund or being kind of, you know? Yeah, we made the decision other than me saying I was supportive of friends, family, private equity, venture capital, banks, whatever was on your side of the table, I would be honest and supportive. You know, why am I selling? What do I see the future is? Would I be willing to roll equity? You know, all those things to, to lend support to that dialogue because I believed in the business and I believed in them. But other than that, I view that as these are your new partners that you're going to have to deal with whatever you disclose to them or discuss with them or the terms you set, those are really for you. I just want to be supportive. Um, so a lot of that was really left. I pretty much dealt with my partners and eventually my partners and a few friendly attorneys. I mean, it was, it was really controlled in that way so that I wasn't negotiating with anybody that ultimately would be their partner. You know, one of the questions that can trip up a lot of first time sellers is this very benign sounding question, which is, why do you want to sell? 
And in your case, I think that was a legitimate question because here you are, you're a admitted soccer nut. You love soccer. You have all these businesses in soccer. You're wealthy and don't need the money. You haven't been taking money out of the business. You're like not working in the business. So like a sophisticated buyer could say, Mac, like, this sounds like a gravy train. Like, like you love it. It's a passion. You don't need the money. So like, why are you selling? Had you rehearsed the answer to that question? Yeah. So, and I think, I think you would appreciate this as well. I mean, I've over my career, I've made you know so many mistakes. I've done a few things right. But one of the things that just constantly is in the back of my mind is what people laughingly to, to this day call black swan events, which I have been through so many. You know, I've a lot of black swans out there. <laughs> yeah, these black swans are multiplying. Yeah. So, you know, I I started my first business in 95 and I was early in web one and I had a, you know, big term sheet in March of 2000 and the NASDAQ blew up and then I was running, you know, so I, I've seen the, you can't possibly know what's around the corner happen too many times. And I just had that like, okay, I love the business. I'd be okay if I didn't sell for sure, which was a a luxury kind of to be in that position. But I also had that like something could change. Like the person at Barcelona that we deal with could leave, could get hit by a bus and give it to his cousin. You know, I mean, there's all these X factors that I just thought, you know, that's a risk and I'd be willing to take the risk, but I also am not going to ignore that it exists. So that was part of it. And then the other was just the timing value to me. Like I said to them is if we do a deal in the next quarter, it has a lot more value to me than it does two years from now because I had a daughter getting ready to go to college. I had, you know, things that were real world stuff. And I'm like, that money is valuable to me right now. I I would love to have extra liquidity. Um, But if it's a year from now, I might not be in that same position. I may not want to do it, you know? So, so there were a couple of things that were very honest in kind of where we were. Awesome. And the deal worked out great. And, and, and yeah, super happy. Super happy. Are you up for a quick lightning round of questions? And Mac, when we do these, I, I would love just a quick answer uh, to the question. If you're good, I've got maybe half a dozen and I'll let you go. Perfect. Yes. Awesome. Um, before I set this up, I, I want my listeners to know that Mac has sold six companies and he's sort of referenced them along the way. And so, Mac, as you answer these questions, please feel free to draw not only on the ISL ex- you know, experience, but also the other businesses that you sold. I know you've had a ton of experience, so feel free to okay. draw on all of your experience. You ready to go? Yes, sir. Awesome. What is the most questionable or slimiest trick a prospective acquirer has tried to play on you? The slimiest trick. Um, I think trying to use equity, so a, a group that was negotiating to buy our company when I was relatively young and pretty naive, valued their business in a way that that was ridiculous and not defensible. But I didn't really know enough to ask the questions about how they were valuing. I just saw them as a big, successful company, and you know they were putting a massive inflated value on their business, which meant my conversion to equity was relatively small versus what it should have been. Super important for folks who are rolling equity into a new entity or accepting shares and replace uh, in in the deals they make. What was the biggest mistake you made in the process of selling any of your companies? I think the biggest mistake, and I've sadly made it more than once, but is... uh, you know, anytime there is a performance component, which is you know, earnouts or anything like that, I I made the mistake of thinking I had cleverly figured out an earnout structure that I almost couldn't lose. Um, only to shortly after the deal was done, the group that I ran and managed when I controlled this great earnout that I was excited and I was very confident in, the acquirer moved me out of that group five days later, and. I realized that that was perfectly legal and fair for them to do, and maybe even a better position for me within their organization. I lost 100% control of the earnout within five days. Wow! And and were you able to realize any of that earnout as a result? Not much. Not much. It was wow. it was way under expectation as a result. 
and in retrospect, time being, uh, you know, some, some water under the bridge, do you think they moved you to make it impossible to hit your earnout? I, I don't really think there was massive ill intent. I, I think that was probably on a list of things of, and we can probably reduce the earnout. Um, I think they legitimately thought it was a good move, you know, but, uh, but I do think it was on the, the list of, okay, and it wouldn't hurt if we didn't have to pay millions of dollars of this earnout. <laughs> what was the highest point you have reached in the process of selling any of your companies? In terms of emotional? Highest emotional point. So the the greatest for me, my second company, which was um, kind of caught in the dot-com bursting of the bubble, we were running out of money. We had a big term sheet that was kind of getting worse by the day. We ended up selling the business to a public company in Europe, and we created a bidding war. They kind of bid this business up and... When I looked at the reality, I don't think we had 30 days of payroll when we got the kind of term sheet to do this 15 plus million dollar deal at a really strong you know, valuation. And it just felt like, you know, we got everything right. And so I was, you know, I was on cloud nine because we were, we were definitely staring at and behind door number two is it just goes under. <laughs> Wow. Are there resources that you could point our listeners to? Again, uh, our listeners tend to be sophisticated business people uh, who are curious about the process of exiting a company. And I know you've done it six times. And so I'd be curious to know, are there go-to books that you rely on or relied on in the past to educate yourself on this process? Or are there speakers that you follow, uh, you know, we've heard, uh, there's a guy in Australia called Tom McCaskill. I don't know if you've seen any of his stuff. He's worth a, a read. Anything you could point people to that would be helpful? No, I mean, honestly, your, your stuff is, is great. And I've been a, a fan and follower, you know, read, read the, the first book and I think your stuff is great. Um, I think, oh, um, yeah, and obviously, you, you know, you've had a lot of great guests, but I, I really, I think it's um, for me. It was surrounding myself with with mentors. You know, I just really was focused on. I'm going to make mistakes. I need people that have made the mistake ahead of me, and so I really focused on not even necessarily exit mentors, but what am I missing? What questions would you ask? And so I really put a big priority on advisors and investors or uh, advisors and mentors around me as I went through the journey myself. That's that's probably been my biggest thing. Got it. Got it. And I I have to ask, was there anything that you bought yourself after the ISL exit? I know you probably got everything you possibly want. You've got Barcelona tickets from now until the end of time. But is there anything you bought yourself as a trophy to commemorate the win? No, it's, well, you know, my, my very first exit, just to hit rewind, I mean, I literally did the, you know, my life's material dream list. I bought the 911 convertible. <laughs> <laughs> went from the dealership to the Rolex store, bought a beach house. I mean, I went check, 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 check every materialistic thing I could, you know, ever dream of. And like a lot of people say, I mean, after that, it was kind of like, okay, now I don't need or want to do that as much anymore. And so, I, you know, the most recent thing I've done, which is post that deal, which I'm sure in some way was enabled by it, is I purchased a professional soccer team in Spain. And so that was a life dream that, um, I think all of those experiences kind of enabled. And uh, so it wasn't a direct result of like the proceeds as much as it was kind of on that journey and, and post that deal. You're the first guy I've met that has bought a professional sports team. So that's, uh, that's awesome. Appreciate uh, checking that box. I would be curious to know though, uh, what you learned from that experience. Remember our listeners are, are going to go through a liquidity event they're going to get the big check, the the six, the seven, the eight, the nine figure check, and it may be the first big check they've ever received. And I'd be curious to know what advice you might pass on to someone tempted to go to the nine eleven dealership and the Rolex. You know, like what you know. Obviously, you've had that experience, so I'd just be curious to know if you had a do over, what you might change about that first exit. Yeah, I, I think there were a few things that I did wrong and it, it, you know, it felt great. And I would tell anyone, I told myself, I mean, you know, my wife thankfully agreed with me is like, I worked hard. I, I needed something, right. I wanted to celebrate and 
So I do think there's definitely use a percentage of proceeds to do something you've always wanted to do, you know, take care of yourself type of thing. I think the two biggest mistakes I made, you know, one is I, I did it fast and aggressively. It was almost an emotional thing. I went out and sprayed money versus buy the nice car if that's what you really care about. And then take three months before you make the decision on the beach house or something else. Um, and I may have come to the same decisions, but I know I didn't really thoughtfully work through some of those. I just said, I have a pile of money. I'm going to go spend it uh, or some of it. And the other thing I made a really big mistake is because I was a young guy, I was also free. I'd made my money in a tech company. I was massively concentrated in technology stock, both in terms of the equity from the acquirer that went public of my company, but just in general, that's the space I knew. And so when the NASDAQ crashed, I lost, you know, 90% of my net worth probably because I didn't diversify. Wow. I was fine. I mean, I had another exit, you know, a year later, but I, but it was, it was a real hard lesson to realize what people say all the time, like diversify, even if you're an expert in something like you need some real estate, some bonds, some things that, you know, I, I did not know to do that. I didn't have anybody advising me. I just did what I knew. And that was a mistake. Super helpful for our listeners to hear that directly from you. Uh, I appreciate you sharing your story. Mac, where can people find you if they want to reach out and say hi on social media or what's the best way? Sure. So I, I, um, my name, Mac Lackey, M-A-C-L-A-C-K-E-Y. I have a website, so MacLackey.com and across social media, it's generally at Mac Lackey. Um, so all those would be great. And I'd love to be helpful with anybody that I can, you know, share or help in any way. Awesome. And we'll put all of Max, uh, socials and the connection points, uh, in the episode, uh, featured at, uh, built cell.com. So check out that he'll have, we'll have his LinkedIn and his, all of the different, uh, places to reach Mac. Mac, thanks for doing this. Thanks so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. And there you have it for today's podcast between John and Mac. If you enjoyed today's show, then as a reminder to hit that subscribe button. If you want to watch this full interview, as a reminder, you can do so over at our YouTube channel, which is at Built to Sell Radio. I personally feel that seeing some of the facial expressions truly adds something unique to the show. So a quick reminder to head over to our YouTube channel and subscribe, which is at Built to Sell Radio. For show notes, including links to everything referenced in today's episode, including the article I mentioned at the beginning of the show, you can head over to the show notes page, which can be found over at builttosell.com. There, you'll not only find everything referenced today's episode, but also you'll find definitions for some of the more technical terms used in today's interview. Special thanks to Dennis Labatagula for handling today's audio engineering, and thank you to our community of certified value builders who help us bring our message to you. Our advisors are experts in helping you build the value of your company. To get in touch with an advisor or learn how to become one yourself, head over to valuebuilder.com. I'm Colin Morgan. I look forward to talking to you again next week.